Today, I have Sharon St. John. She is an author, and I'm very excited to have her on the show today. So welcome to uh, the Oh Hell No podcast, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Sharon wrote a book. It's called Me, Myself, and Men. It's a memoir in which she explores her personal self-esteem struggles and her relationships with men. So this is an important topic because as we know, self-esteem, you you know, it it really can affect all areas of your life. So I want to start off by asking you, when did you realize that you had low self-esteem? I want to say when I was really young, because I was always compared to my sisters and, um, you know, being in foster care, I was compared to my foster sisters as well. Um, so yeah, it started really early on with me comparing myself to them or listening to what others would say was, you know, pretty versus not pretty. And I always fell in the not pretty category. So I always Mm -hmm. felt, you know, that's always felt that that's when it started for me. Right. And when you say really young, would you say like, 10 or eight or like when did you realize like mm. well my mom you know again I'm dark skinned my sisters are all light skinned and all that so it it was it was really young five my memory goes back to age five I think mm-hmm. that's the earliest memory that I had and so I will always remember my mom comparing my hair to my sister's hair okay. you know because their, their dad they have a different father than I do so Got they're it. Right. So it was, my mom really was the one who started. started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm dark skin too, girl. And we are fly, please. <laughs> oh, no, now I know. <laughs> right. Now we know. Um, so what are some ways low self-esteem affected your life personally and professionally? So let's start with personally. Well, I mean, that's what the whole book is about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's just start off slow. Like, let's, you know, because we're going to talk about the book a little bit later. So let's start off. So let's say personally growing up, being a young woman, um, having friendships. How did the low self-esteem show up in your friendships? Did they ruin friendships for you? Did it, you know, like what was what, what happened with that? With friends, I didn't necessarily have a problem with making friends because because I was, I felt the way I felt like I didn't want anybody else to feel that way about themselves. So, you know, if there was a, the kid in school that sat by themselves, I would notice that they were sitting by themselves and I would go sit with them. So making friends, I really just did not have a problem with making friends. But I noticed that a lot of my friends were the girls that everybody else considered super pretty. Like they were the, they were the pretty girls. They were the it girls. So I would always be the odd man out when, you know, when people are looking at the group, like, you know how they, oh, well, people used to say back in the days, like in a group of pretty girls, there's always the one ugly girl. Like I right. always felt like the one ugly girl amongst the sea of pretty girls, mm. but it, it, they didn't, you know, those girls, they didn't treat me as if, you know, I was the the ugly girl in the group. You know, they, they didn't make me feel that way. I didn't have issues with friends. Yeah, that was more like probably just you in your head, you being in your head. Right. It was more me feeling like I didn't fit in with them. Like I didn't really, I felt privileged to be with them, although I, (laughs) it wasn't a privilege to be with them. I was just me and they, those girls liked me for me, but I didn't see it that way. I just saw it as like, again, I was privileged to be these girls, let me hang out with them. So you were not a toxic, you know, person 
who suffered from low self-esteem. You were just somebody who had low self-esteem and you felt empathy towards other people who might be in the same boat as you. So you went out of your way to make them comfortable. So it seems as at least the people who you notice might be alone or, you know, like you said, you might see someone sitting by themselves and you go over. I feel like I felt on the inside, I felt ugly. So if I looked at somebody and I saw that they probably was feeling like how I felt Mm -hmm. on the inside, I I, I gravitated toward them. Yeah, that's sweet. (laughs) I like that. I like that you were like that, but you weren't toxic. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who have low self-esteem and they're toxic. They go around and they try to, you know, I don't know, dismantle others or maybe bring others to make them feel lower than they themselves feel yeah there's people out there that you know that picked on other people because they were feeling bad about themselves no that right. wasn't I, I for me I internalized a lot of stuff like I mentally abused myself no one was able to look at me and tell that I was feeling any kind of way on the inside like you know when my foster mother and when they would when I would hear them say that I was ugly like I never let them know that their words had an effect on me I put on that brave front but inside it was, it was killing me. (laughs) Yeah, of course. So professionally, how did, did low self-esteem show up for you at work or was it just like a personal thing? More so personal. I think it was more so personal for me because at work with getting a promotion and things like that, that's what I, I felt again, like, oh, they're going to pick, because it was always, they picked the long haired girl or the, you know, so Mm. it, it bothered me in that sense. Like if you were light skin and long hair, you got the job over me. And that's why, but I never, I never hated on those women who got the positions because it's not their fault. You know what I mean? Right. It's was, it was the person who made that selection. So I never hated on the, the person who got the position, but I always, again, I never let anybody see that I was hurting on the inside, but that's how I felt on the inside. I, I, I internalize it to say, well, I'm, they didn't pick me because of the way I look. Right. Okay. So why, I know you said that you think that this all came from your mom and the way that she treated you and your sisters. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that whole experience. Do you think that she also was treated like that? I mean, was your mom dark skin? Did your mom look light skin? Um, do you think that that came from how she was brought up and then she kind of perpetuated that behavior when she became a mom and didn't realize it? No, um, my mom started having kids when she was young, mm-hmm. uh, 14, actually. So she was a child raising a child and just didn't know any better. And but no, my mother knew from day one that she was beautiful and gorgeous. And, and like no, she had no issues um, among her brothers and sisters they probably had um, issues because my mom was the one with the pretty hair and, you know, all of that stuff that, you know, that doesn't really mean anything, mm-hmm. but, you know. Back Are you, then, is your yeah. background American or is there any Caribbean in your family? My, so, yes, my mom, all my brothers and sisters, my mom is, they were all born in Jamaica. Me and my younger sister was born in Brooklyn, New York. Mm. So it's so funny. (laughs) I didn't even know that, guys. I'm just asking because it just sounds very Caribbean. (laughs) Like, you know what I'm saying? My parents are from Jamaica as well. So, yeah. So it just, you know, sounds like a little Caribbean with the whole hair and the skin and the whole thing. So, yeah. (laughs) All right. So what was your worst moment where you decided that you needed to make a change in your life? Like where, where did you, what happened? If there was something that happened that really made you feel like, yo, I need to get my life together. Like, this is crazy. My last relationship, I was in it for 10 and a half years and it was totally toxic, like totally toxic. And I don't, I, even to this day, I still sit back and I think, why did I stick it out? So all of my relationships were toxic, but I I stayed in that one the longest. And I, I don't know why, 
throughout the course of that, I had to really start taking stock, like self inventory and like, why, why are you taking this? Why are you dealing with this? I just had to keep asking myself. And every time I thought I came up with an answer, it, you know, the I'm sorry's and, you know, it never happened again. And, you know, I, I fell for it every time. So it was just. So was the toxic, um, behaviors were they cheating was it abusive physically or just mentally or a combination of all three a combination of all three it was you know the emotional abuse of you know park around the corner so nobody see you You can't you know no one could see me with you drive your own car to the movies drive your own we'll meet at the supermarket um being told that no one else will want me the physical abuse, the it, it was all of that. All of it. It was horrible, but. Wow. That's crazy that he would even say something like that to you. Yeah. It's like, you know, when I, you know, you got to age in the thirties and 35 and you start that, that you get baby fever. Like I'm going to just, well, so at one point it's, it's in the book. So at one point, you know, I was feeling like, yeah, I want to have a baby. I want to have a baby. And um, so we got into it over one of his cheating episodes. And um, he I, he hit me and I fell to the ground. And then he he kicked me <laughs> in my vagina. Wow. Um, because, you know, I was talking about I wanted to have a baby. Like, it, it was to that point. So when did you finally leave? Like, what was it that made you leave? The last person that he cheated with like there was other you know there was females that he cheated with but none of them was like like this chick she was just relentless with the nonsense and when I thought it was just a you know a fling type of thing it turned out it was a full-on relationship um for two years that he was having with her and then you know she was doing things my car got sugar in the tank it was just all types of just stalker just stalking me type of situation. My car windows being busted out when I come out the window. And I just, I was like, I'm done. I, I can't, I can't deal with this situation anymore. Like it's, this is just getting to be too much for me. And so with that, I was just done with him. And I was just like, I, I have to get away. I have to get away from this situation. And I think also it made it easier when I finally um, moved away from New York mm-hmm. and, and really put some distance between us that that helped yeah definitely so how what did you do to start repairing your self-esteem did you go to therapy did you self-help like what did you do I did not go to therapy and probably still need it but (laughs) I started writing I just I wrote and then I started jogging and while jogging I was just having a good old time talking to God (laughs) That, they say that, journaling is a really good way to, you know, get out all of those emotions. And it's like cathartic. So, I mean, it is kind of like going to therapy. Yeah. So that's what I did. I, I just, I wrote, and but I've been writing like ever since I got my little first heartbreak. Um, I've been jotting down those stories and, and that's how the book came to be. That's, that's how the book came to be. Like, I just kept writing stuff down and as, as I, wrote more I started seeing you know pretty much the common denominator is me in these situations it was about me realizing wow it's something in me it's something that I'm putting out there I can't keep blaming these men it's something about me and what I found was I just did not love myself obviously I didn't love myself for me to tolerate the stuff that I was tolerating so I was like I have to take a step back and just get in touch with me and start accepting me for me and not accepting what what everybody was, the little pieces of themselves that everybody was willing to give me because I was giving my all in, in anything that I do. I don't know whether it's because I'm a Scorpio or what, but you know, when I love hard, I, I, when I love, I love hard. If I'm your friend, I am a ride or die friend. And I was giving myself in friendships and in relationships and I just wasn't getting it back so I just had to take a step back and was like you know what I'm gonna give as good as I get if I don't get it back if it's not being reciprocated then I'm walking away I'm done good for you 
So you wrote this book, you started journaling, you got all collection of like all your thoughts and you started to see that you were the problem. When did it dawn on you that you should take all of the information that you have been journaling and putting together into a book? Because I realized I'm not the only one, you know, my niece, she was getting a little older and she was starting, you know, date like boys and stuff like that. And she would say certain things. And I was like, and to me, she's an absolutely beautiful girl. And when she was questioning herself and I was like, wow, it, it can't just be me. And so I told her back then when I started writing, I told her when she get a little older, I'm gonna let her read my book <laughs> when it's done. And she's now 20. And so it felt good to actually sign a copy and give it to her. Mm -hmm. And when she read it, she was like, wow, auntie, like, you went through that. I can relate to that. I know that. So things like that, it, my trials and tribulations will be able to help someone else. So that's what made me say, you know what, if I can help someone else not put themselves in those situations, then, then that's what it, that's what I want to do. So in the book, you talk about your relationships, you talk about um, your struggle with self-esteem, and what else do you talk about? Do you um, give tips on how to, you know, um, get past self-esteem issues? Like, give us a, a rundown of how the book is broken down. Well, everyone's going to have their own. When it comes to tips and things like that, everyone has their own news. So what worked for me might not work for you. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I don't want to tell someone else like this is what you have to do. But what I do say is find whatever makes you happy, whatever you enjoy doing and focus more on that. And when you focus on that, you won't be so focused on the negative. You won't be so focused on what this person is saying and that one is saying and that one is doing because you're doing what makes you happy. So for me, like with jogging and, and, you know, I just love to sing. So I go jogging, I put my music on and I, I just sing and I don't care who's around and I'm, that's what I love to do. And that's, I literally lost like 35 pounds without jogging every single day and just, and just singing. But that's what made me happy. And I know when I was out there doing that, I was not thinking about what that man said to me, what this, you know, chick was doing to me. I, I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. And I would, I became focused on something else. And with, um, I actually have two books. I wrote me, myself, a man, and then I have a book called Issues, which is um, fiction. But I started writing that and I was focused on building those characters and doing all that stuff. And so I was engulfed in doing something that brought me joy. And I, I, could, I didn't have time to focus on the negative person that was around me. And then, you know, just getting that person away from me. And I was able to channel those those emotions that I probably couldn't say or didn't say. And I, I expressed them through my writing. So in working on your self-esteem, what has been the hardest hurdle for you? And um, what are you the most proud of today? With working on self-esteem, I feel like I knew that I was creating this mental prison for myself because it was in my head. It was in my head that I was feeling ugly. It was, feeling, it was in my head that I was feeling less than. So the hardest thing was actually believing that I'm worthy, believing that I deserve more and I'm, I'm better. And it sounds crazy, but you have to really believe it. It's not enough to just look in the mirror and just say, you know what? You're okay. You're okay. You're going to be okay. You have to really believe it. You have to feel it. You have to exude it when you walk in your speech, you, you, and, and that was a hard point for me to get to because I kept backfiring. And I would look in the mirror and say, I'm, I'm not taking this from him no more. I'm not taking this from that person anymore. And then I would find myself right back in it because I didn't really believe it when I was saying it. So when I got to the point when I was like, I, I, I believe, I know this to be true. I know there's more out there for me. I know I deserve better. That's when it became easier for me to believe and stick to it. I'm proud of the fact that I, I have gotten past it. I'm proud of the fact that I'm okay with being alone and it has gotten me this far. Right. I'm, I'm proud of myself for 
getting out of those situations and, and moving past them. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with being alone. I'm telling you, I mean, I, I'm married, but I always say if I was in a relationship that wasn't serving me, I would definitely rather be alone than be with someone just for the sake of saying you're with someone, but it serves no purpose or it's not, you know, like making you feel good. So don't ever, and this is for everybody listening to this podcast, like don't think that having someone and being able to say you have someone is better than being alone because there's nothing wrong with being alone. Being alone, you have peace, you can be happy, you do what you want to do. You stay alone until you find someone that's bringing something to the table that's worthy of your time and attention. And that's how I look at life. And um, I, you don't you know. need anyone to validate you. Right. That, yeah. And, Absolutely and not. And people tend to think that, you know, like, oh, I don't want to be alone. So I'd rather sit here and be with this dude who's cheating on me or this person who um, doesn't. Belittles you. And yeah, just, just but that. right. Bel- belittles you, doesn't bring anything to the table, doesn't take you out, doesn't treat you nicely, doesn't do anything that you enjoy. Like, no, boo, you could do bad by your damn self. You know what I mean? Like, you That's could. Bad. Be by yourself and have a great time. You can travel, you can do things. And I mean, there's so much to do and see in this world. Like being tied down to some whack ass man or woman or whatever. No, it's a no. Okay. When you read my book, that's what I started doing. That was another thing I did. I started treating myself to vacations. I was going on vacations by myself. Yeah. I, I got tired of waiting, you know, and I was like, if I keep waiting on people to finally do things with me and make me happy, I'm, I'm going to be miserable because mm-hmm. I want to go places. I want to see places. And I'm, you know, I'm waiting for this man to come and show up in my life and take me on these trips and do all this. And it, that's, it did not, it, it wasn't coming to fruition. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start going. So every year, anybody who knows me, I go away for my birthday every year. I'm going someplace and I'm going by myself and I always find I enjoy myself. I enjoy my company because like I said, I'm a, I'm not an introvert. So when I go someplace, I just talk to people. Hey, how you doing? What's going on over here? You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to enjoy myself. Absolutely. And that's amazing. I commend you on that. So what are some signs would you say for people who have children or just people who might not realize that they're on that, you know, low self-esteem, you know, path, what would you say are some signs that they should pay attention to, um, to let you know that some, you might want to check your, you know, your self-esteem? I think so. Low self-esteem shows up in people differently. You have the, you know, people that are just, they're outward where you can look at them and tell, but you know, their shoulders are hunched. They, you know, they, they don't present themselves. Um, well, you know, well-groomed or whatever. And and that's not even necessarily the case because some people just, you know, everybody's not fashionista or anything like that, but Mm -hmm. you know, people that just walk with their head down, they stay Mm -hmm. to themselves all the time. They, they don't, they're not necessarily social you notice that why do you know why don't they have any friends why are they always by themselves there there's there's something going on there somebody you know just talk to them you know look and in, look into signs like that um there are some people that are very outgoing and are very social like myself that are still suffering from um low self-esteem and with those people you have to look a little deeper you have to look past the facade of it all Mm -hmm. um because they might be in you have to look at the certain situations that people put themselves in and you will see that the normal person a normal person would never have tolerated situations like that so when you see someone putting themselves in situations or they you see them in toxic situations. There's something going on there with that person's self-esteem 
as well. Even though that person, you know, like I said, maybe outgoing and, and to the easy on the eyes or whatever the case may be. Um, Cause there's a lot of beautiful people out there that are suffering from low self-esteem in different, it, it shows up in different ways. So you can't really put a, a finger on it to say, well, you know, my child is doing this. So maybe there's a self-esteem issue here, but the, the obvious things would be someone who is introverted, you know, lock themselves in a room all the time, don't want to talk, don't want to, you know, things like that. Those are obvious signs that something is going on. So what advice would you give to parents about helping to build their kids' self-esteem um, to make sure that they are doing all the right things so that their children don't end up in the situation that you ended up in, you know, at the hands of, you know, your mom not knowing any better. We're not blaming her because when you know better, you do better, right? Right. As young parents, I mean, we all make mistakes as parents. I'm a parent. I've made mistakes. So by no means am I judging your mom. But what advice would you give to um, people out there who are raising children right now about pouring into your children? Like I said before, I just focus on stuff that I like to do. You know, I'm like... <laughs> Again, I, I'm not going to blame my mother. We've had this discussion, um, you know, back when I was like, oh, I want to dance because I was very big into I want to be Debbie Allen. I want to dance. Um, <laughs> and it was, oh, you don't know how to dance, girl. You, you know, that type of thing. If you see your child out there trying to do a two-step and her two steps turns into three or four, so what? You know what I mean? So what? She's dancing, <laughs> She's if she's singing and she sounds horrible, so what? She's singing and she thinks she sounds good. You let her sing. Encourage, encourage them. Build up their self esteem, even though you know they're not great at. Because eventually, you know, they'll probably move on to something else, or they'll eventually see that, you know, that was a passing phase for me. Like I was into that at one point, but you encourage them. Don't discourage your child in any way with something that they say. If they want to draw, if they say, mommy, I want to be an artist and all they're doing is stick figures, you tell them that's the best stick figure that you've ever seen in your life. But right. don't make them feel like, oh, no, child, that's terrible. You, you know, you could do, you know, you encourage them to be whatever it is that they want to be. You just instill that they are OK and it will get better if they just practice whatever it is, but don't make them feel less than, or don't compare them to anyone else. So that was the thing so my mom did with me. <laughs> what do you do to keep yourself on your path so that you don't fall back into your old ways? Like, is there anything that you do like affirmations or is it just your journaling? Like I do affirmations. I do look in the mirror every, every day and I reassure myself. Um, I do, I still write, still, you know, but again, I don't want to keep writing about, you know, bad relationships and stuff like that. Once I finish writing me, myself and men, I sincerely hope never to have to add another chapter <laughs> into that book. Um, but I still just like the the art of, of writing and creating characters and, and things of that nature. I still jog. I still love to sing. When I find myself interested in someone, I pray that it, um, you know, that I don't make some of the same mistakes that I made before. I try to be more aware and alert to signs of, you know, something is not right here. I try to stay in tune to them. I try not to um, accept. Once I see it, I'm going to vocalize it. I'm going to speak on it. And if it you know, if it's something that that's just in that person, then it's, I know that I'm not going to stick around. I'm going to move on. Okay. So do you feel like you are doing purpose-driven work by, you know, writing your book and helping people? Do you, do you even do anything with regard to self-esteem or you just wrote the book and put it out there and you're letting it do what it does? When I released the book, it was right in March, right at COVID. Mm. So there was no promotions and doing book signings and readings. And there, yeah, there wasn't any of that to be done at the, the time. And then, you know, we're just really coming out of it here in California. We're just, you know, starting to open things back up. 
like literally within yeah. the last few weeks. So of course I would love to start doing panels and stuff like that and just having people come out and read. I would love to have done all of that when I first um, released the book, but of course, you know, COVID shut everything down. Yeah, COVID definitely did shut a lot of stuff down, but girl, everybody's online these days. They're on they're in Clubhouse. They're on um, doing lives on Instagram. <laughs> like I, they are just I, they are pivoting I, <laughs> like I nobody's business. Worse when it comes to any form of social media, I am terrible with it. <laughs> I barely know how to work Zoom. Like I'm, I'm. I know that everybody was like, doing a lot of Zoom stuff, but oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. Well. Tell but I, I need to get better. I need I need to get better, but with all of that. Yeah, just, absolutely. Because if you have you know, a message to share, there are definitely a variety of ways that you can share your message, yeah. even with COVID holding us down right now. Um, I'm telling you, people are all over doing things and you know, so you know, just jump in. I am, yeah, I know I have to do better. <laughs> You'll get there. So tell everybody where we can purchase your book or, you know, keep up, check out your blogs and, and look at your website. Well, my website is SharonStJohnAuthor.com. It's a good website. I have um, book trailers, like little video book trailers that give you, you know, a little insight to what the book, both books, Issues and Me, Myself and Men will be about. And um, the books are on all online retailers. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million, all of those online sources, you can pick up any copy of the book, hard copy or um, paperback. And um, I am on social media, Instagram, and um, you see, I don't even remember all of them. That's how bad I am with them. And Twitter, I'm <laughs> on all of them. <laughs> but I mean, okay, it's a lot. I have a personal page on Facebook, and then I have the Sharon St. John author page. Um, on Facebook as well. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for coming on the podcast and sharing a little bit of your journey with us and um, what you've learned and how you're trying to help others. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me.